I believe it is critical for the church to be able to respond to current issues and to do so through a biblical lens. And let me begin my remarks today by saying that as we do this, as we speak to current issues, especially issues as they relate to human sexuality, the use of derogatory language or crude terminology is sincerely out of place and out of bounds with the teaching of Jesus Christ. There is no place for that kind of behavior. Churches like Westboro Baptist Church are antithetical to the way and person of Jesus Christ. All Christians should be easily able to see that they do not represent a biblical worldview. Every individual is uniquely created in the image of God and has inherent value and worth as a human being who is loved by God. There is no place for rude, disparaging, or demeaning comments from the people of God. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. When I research this, that word any means any, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. Now, this does not mean that it is wrong to call sin, sin. But it does indeed mean that we must call sin a sin in a loving and humble manner. We recognize that we too are forgiven of sin in our own lives from our Savior. But it is important to also understand that to receive God's forgiveness, you must first of all admit that you have indeed sinned. And that, my friends, is the problem with the modern worldviews surrounding sexuality and gender identity in our culture. Forgiveness is not possible unless you are first willing to admit that you have violated God's standard. So it becomes critical to know what is God's standard. Does he have a plan for human sexuality? Are there, are there boundaries that he has actually established? How do we determine gender in the eyes of God? I want you to turn in your scriptures, if you would, to the sixth chapter of 1 Corinthians. This was written to people in a town called Corinth, a very pagan town. Paul wrote them to especially deal with their view of the body. And you need to know that my goal for us this morning as we enter into this topic is for us to just focus on this one central concept of how God himself views our body. If we can begin to see as God sees, then we will more likely do as God says. Part of the reason we go to extremes today is because we fail to see things as God sees them. Human sexuality, gender identity, all of it is taken to extremes when we fail to see those issues from the perspective of a holy God. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20, the Apostle Paul writes to this church in Corinth, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Do you not know? And most of us do not know. Honestly, we had no idea that our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is inside of us. When the Corinthians originally read this letter, something immediate came into their mind because they had a temple right in the middle of their city. In Corinth, there was a temple to the goddess Aphrodite. 
When Corinthians read this, when he wrote temple, they, they thought, oh, temple, I know, temple. That's, they knew what the temple was. We don't really kind of get that same connection. A temple was a building that was erected to illicit worship of a deity. That when you went to the temple, you were there for one specific purpose. That was to give your time and your devotion to your God, little g. In the Old Testament, the Jews had a temple. And in that temple, the Spirit of God dwelled in the Ark of the Covenant. You, you remember all of those stories, and the Jews would, would go into the temple with the purpose of worshiping God, being cleansed from their sins, connecting the best that they could with their God. Big G. The temple was all about worship. And the Apostle Paul says, Okay, I don't know what you've been thinking about your body, but let me tell you what God says about your body. It is a temple. And for those of you who have put your faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit has moved into your body and you house a piece of deity. And God views you as a temple. Your body is not to be worshipped, neither is it to be neglected, because your body is a temple. And Paul goes on to say, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. And this is news for many of us, because he's not just talking about anything, he's talking about your body. God would say, that body that you spend so much time and so much attention and so much money on, heads up, it doesn't belong to you. It's not yours. God would tell us that we have misunderstood. We've thought that it was our body, but it's his. It belongs to God. My body is not my own because God created me and the creator owns the creation. And God purchased me. He sent his son to die for me. He bought me with his blood. I belong to him. And listen, if you are a Christian, your body still belongs to God. He is still your creator, and he owns his creation. If you're not a Christian, but if you are a believer, your body doubly belongs to God because he purchased you. He died for you. He paid for you. Paul concludes in our text by saying these words, Therefore, honor God with your body. In other words, God says, if, if you want to know what I think you should do with your body, don't worship it. Don't neglect it. Honor me with it. Magnify me with it. Use your body to reflect back to me who I am, my love, my grace, my character, my patience, my mercy. I want to look at one more quick verse, and I want to put these two verses together to build the case for where I am headed in, in dealing with this issue of gender identity. I want to lay this foundation, though, first. Look at what Paul writes to another group of Christians in the city of Colossae. Colossians 1, verse 16. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. Now, if you put these, these two passages together, here is what you get. Your body was made by God, for God, to honor God. You see, I want to begin on that foundation that we were made by God, for God, to honor God. Because we need to understand that everything that has been created has been created for a purpose. Even if it was just for pure enjoyment. 
I grew up not very far from Cocoa Beach. People would, would make sand castles on the beach. Sometimes you could see very elaborate works of, of art on the beach. That these people would create and they would ultimately just be washed away or broken down and kicked down by some annoying toddler. But the people that made them did that just because they wanted to enjoy it. You go all the way to something as intricate as a laptop computer. There is always a purpose in the mind of the Creator. You were made for a purpose. It is only in relationship to the Creator that we find our purpose. And the Bible says that His purpose is revealed to us very clearly. In the Word of God, we not only find our purpose for why we were, we were created, but we also see God's revealed standard for how we are to find our true identity. Now, what does the Bible say about gender identity? I believe that God's Word could not be any more clear on this issue. And it is in times when there is so much confusion and so many questions on such topics that Christians can only rely on the one voice that has stood the test of time, the voice of the Almighty God through His Word. Matthew chapter 19, verse 4, Jesus Christ says, Haven't, haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female. In the economy of God, concerning gender identity, there is only male and female. There are only two available options, and those options are not interchangeable. They are confirmed through chromosomes and physiology. Now, when an absolute statement like this is made, many questions are immediately brought up in our minds. What about someone who was born with both sex organs, also known as hermaphroditism? This is an incredibly rare condition that affects about one in 2,000 births. The person born with this condition is still either male or female even if there is a mutation that has both organs in their reproductive organ development, chromosomes do not lie. There is still only the possibility of XX or XY. And it testifies to the original design of God. Look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. What about the individual who truly believes that they are indeed trapped in the body of the wrong gender? We have to ask the question, does God make mistakes? If God has created us for a purpose, can he make mistakes in doing this? If we understand that this world has been marred and broken because of mankind's sin, we have to understand that brokenness is systemic in nature. Sin has affected everything, even our very source of identity. Now you couple that with the sexual looseness of a culture that is saturated in sexual confusion. And you have the ripe fruit of gender confusion available to be plucked. Gender identity confusion, also known as gender dysphoria, is a mental disorder. Robert Jeffress recently said, gender identity confusion is an emotional disorder that should be treated professionally and compassionately. Gender identity confusion should not be exploited by social activists like those in the Obama administration who want to deny the God-given distinction between the sexes. This is a rebellion against the very plan of God. 
And I agree with him 100%. We need to understand that there are people that genuinely do struggle with gender confusion. But the loving response from the body of Christ should be one of affirming God's beautiful gift of their gender. It is to be celebrated, not rejected. In recent months, the issue of sexual identity and gender identity has moved from an academic discussion to an outright war in our culture. This has become the new civil rights movement. And to speak against a transgender individual using a restroom of their choice is labeled hate speech. It isn't just a widely accepted idea anymore that grown men should not be using the same bathroom as little girls. Those fighting for transgender rights in this new culture war are arguing directly against what I have been teaching you this morning. They would say that gender is non-binary, that people can consider themselves gender fluid, meaning they can change their gender identity on any given day, on any given moment, depending on how they feel. They would say that pointing out that they cannot biologically function in both genders, but only the gender of their biological birth, is hate speech. Some individuals with gender dysphoria go so far as having surgery to change their anatomical structure. And sadly, what happens in these cases is their sex organs will be non-functional for the rest of their lives and their bodies will even treat these surgeries as a wound. The very sad truth is that the suicide rate of individuals with gender dysphoria is statistically observable. That's why we need to respond with love and compassion. When we remove ourselves from the simple truth that God has created us for a purpose, that we were created by God, for God, to honor God, only confusion and hurt replace those truths. The follower of Jesus Christ understands that our true identity can only be found in Jesus Christ alone. We know that God only created male or female. There is no third option. The gender we have been given at birth is a beautiful gift from God that needs to be celebrated. And we need to recapture biblical masculinity and biblical femininity. And we need to love everyone, regardless of whether or not they accept biblical truth on these matters or not. It is only by our consistent love, our unwavering stand on truth and confidence in Christ Jesus, that the world will begin to open itself up to the truth on these matters. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise His name, I'm fixed upon it, name of God's redeeming love. Hitherto Thy love has blessed me, Thou hast brought me to this place. And I know thy hand will bring me safely home by thy good grace. Jesus sought me when a stranger 
wandering from the fold of God, here to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above.